afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this session. Um, um, my name is Alok Chaudhary. I'm a professor of supply chain management and also head of supply chain research group at Warwick Manufacturing Group, Warwick University. Today we have a very interesting session we have seen uh, in, in the last couple of sessions, but this specific session is going to focus on why the evolving procurement function is a game changer. And to do that, we have our panel, uh, world leading panels. I think supply chain resilience is a topic of discussion in every C-suite at the moment. And so I will start with you know, three leading experts. Um, to first start with Isabel from Beiersdorf AG. The next we have Klaus, who is also Chief Procurement Officer and Head of Supply Chain at Siemens. <laughs> and last but not the least, we have Len uh, joining us from the US and very early in the morning there, Len, um, Chief Procurement Officer of Johnson & Johnson. Thank you for joining us. So uh, as we know, um, you know, previously where there was a focus on quality and price, now procure executives or also the, the C-suite um, experts, they are looking to understand better about their suppliers, the risk that comes with their suppliers um, and their profiles. A number of additional KPIs are being added to the procurement functions. Um, expanding their sourcing requirements. Uh, everybody that you talk to in the procurement function is talking about di diversifying their supply base and ensuring that they are prepared for any risk or disruption and ensuring that their supply chain are resilient. And it's not the case only with the, with the experts and the industries, but also governments. Uh, they are looking for how they can make their country's supply chain more resilient. So in 2022 and beyond, um, you know, procurement function has a key role to play. So I will start my first question on this topic with Len, if that's okay. Len, directed to you. Uh, how must the procurement function evolve to include a strategic sourcing of suppliers, technological implementation, and climate impact? Sure. So listen, thank you. Happy that I could join you from here in the States. Um, you know, I think we're in this pandemic era. I don't really like to use the word post-pandemic because we still see a significant amount of suffering and, and I think it's been a, a humbling experience. Uh, but I think what we're experiencing now beyond that as it relates to business is related to, a, to what's evolved I think, over the past dozen or so years. I think a lot of it has come out of, of the financial crisis of 2007 and eight. And I think companies became extremely conservative, needed to be extremely conservative and extremely customer focused. So I think we've experienced a tremendous evolution in customization and engagement of our customers. Maybe through that era, in order to drive profit, there's been less investment in the employee and in the supply base. Uh, basically, maybe more of a source of profit and I think coming through this era where we've had to become much more aware and engaged in the health of our employees and the health of our suppliers, I think there's a, a recognition now that we need to kind of have a more balanced view of investment, treat our employees like our customers, treat our suppliers like our customers. And so sourcing or procurement is really becoming an area of growth because if you can provide your product and your service uh, when your competitor cannot, you're gonna have share growth. And I think in the past, you know, there was the expectation, all I needed to do was put the order in and it's there. Now we now recognize that uh, there's a whole organization there, there are people there that we need to care for and we need to ensure are being you know, treated fairly and, and treated well and treated in a way where they can make profit. So I think this is really a transformational time where we need to elevate all those three dimensions of good business. And I think that really requires an elevation of supplier relationship management. And you add on to that the roles that corporations are playing in terms of creating a better, safer, and healthier world. I think the influence now that come from the investments from the various companies 
are going to drive those better practices in your supplier base. Thank you, Len. Um, I will ask the same question to Isabel next. And Isabel, if you do have anything to add on that question. Yeah, I do agree uh, with, with Len on this one. The whole, um, if you want, relationship ecosystem is changing, not only externally with our suppliers, but also internally. We have to be much more embedded with the business, uh, with, within the supply chain, need to understand it better, need to collaborate differently, uh, and much, much closer. And I think the good relationships that we had with our business partners um, in the past have uh, really played out a very um, short uh, connection, very quick alignment. Um, and also internally, when you think about this, is not only about like procurement negotiating prices or getting volume, but it's also when we talked earlier about um, dual sourcing, for example. I mean, I have materials where I have even five suppliers and I don't get the material because there is an issue with the pre-material. And what's really important in that is that we have this collaboration with R&D, with quality, with really understanding the whole release process, uh, how can we either reformulate, and then also within the supply chain and the whole supply network, how can we move material around so that we can continue to ship the product and be on shelf. Excellent, thank you. Klaus, over to you. Yeah, thank you. I, I would like to add, um, the whole function is at the moment in a huge transformation process. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Um, procurement sometimes came from this pure cost cutter focus. I mean, you all know, uh, sometimes the people get the purchasing order, somebody throw it over the fence, and then they have to negotiate like hell. That was typically the request from procurement. Now, if we see the, the current situation, it's much more that we can generate. So uh, we, within Siemens, we say, OK, we are in a transformation process from cost cutter to value creator. So what does it mean? What is a value creator? And the value creator, in our terms, has five dimensions. That's, of course, that's productivity. That's um, quality. That's innovation. How can we use the innovation power of our suppliers more than we did before? It's an enormous um, potential. And the other two things which are so relevant, it's resilience and sustainability. And we've got to find the right balance in, in these uh, five dimensions. And that would lead finally to this additional value for the business. Thank you, Klaus. I will come to those in a, in a minute. but I. Uh, go back again to Len, ask him the question. You, you lead uh, you know, functional transformation procurement at Johnson & Johnson. What has been the impact of that transformation for the organization? And, uh, and, and what comes next? I'm also tempted, it's early in the morning there, I'm also tempted to ask, what gets you up in the morning there? <laughs> Well, listen, you know, when you work for the world's largest healthcare company during the greatest healthcare crisis of our lifetime, uh, you know, what you do is, is valuable and obviously valued. And I think it's really the core of who we are. So there's no problem getting up in the morning, but uh, coffee always helps as well, right? Um, I, I think, you know, the issue here with procurement, I think, is the fact that it's going from, to Klaus's point, kind of a doing function to an enabling function. And I think it really is a uh, pivotal around quality of execution for any organization. And I use the analogy in our organization around the fact that procurement is evolving to uh, comparable to a human resources function. And I say that because every one of us, uh, we're given two critical items in order to execute our projects, our plans, our organization. We're given people and we're given budgets. And, and obviously, many, many organizations have invested heavily around people leadership and investment in being a good leader and a good manager. I believe we equally need to invest in people's capabilities around supplier relationship management because the majority of those budgets are spent with third parties. So now procurement not only has to manage those relationships and shaping the supplier base, but procurement has to be the tide that lifts all boats. How do we transfer those experiences and those practices into everyone in the organization who has to work with suppliers. You know, to Klaus's point, maybe in the past we were called in, go get me a better price, 
and then we're called in when something goes wrong. Well, the reality is we need to be engaged through that entire cycle. Because what we want to do is make sure that we're working with the right supplier for solving the right problem, and we're being a good customer. You want to be a good customer of choice because this collaborative environment really defines and drives mutual benefit and hopefully better execution. So the function comparable to HR now is a function that really needs to create the tools, the processes, but most importantly, deliver the practices to really elevate your organization. I like to say we want to have 100,000 plus great procurement people at Johnson & Johnson because we have 100,000 plus people in our organization that work with suppliers. Thank you. Um, I will move on to Klaus, uh, and you talked about multiple dimensions of, uh, you know, this, this uh, new, um, what you call as business model of cost cutter to a value creator. And that seems very exciting, and, but that also comes with issues around decoupling and globalization that you mentioned. But that also comes along with the other factors, five different factors you talked about, um, specifically around, um, you know, quality, innovation, resilience, and sustainability. So the question is, how do you go about balancing those? That's the major challenge, isn't it? It's absolutely the major challenge, but before I answer the question, I would like to go back to some of the stuff which was presented this morning. I heard this morning a lot of people say, what's the new normal? Okay? And we also had the question within the company, and I said, hey, look, there will be no new normal. The unexpected, maybe, is the new normal. And you, you mentioned that, decoupling, for example. Uh, if the different regions are drifting apart, China from the US and the like, um, these are the challenges. Or maybe any circumstances like the Suez Channel um, problem we had affects the supply chain even more than before. So what's the consequence out of that? The consequence is, from our point of view, is we have a significant change of what we buy, where we buy, and how we buy. For example, what we buy, we buy definitely in future more things like as a service. You know the discussion when you buy software, now you buy software as a service. Probably tomorrow we buy things only on a service base. When it comes to how we buy, we use definitely more platforms than we did before. I mean, if you see your private life, you use platforms like Amazon and the like, like Hell. Why don't we use that stuff also in the business environment? And finally, the where we buy is also so relevant. We've got to find the right balance on a regional level. We cannot sell, maybe tomorrow, um, a train in the US which has parts from, the chi from, from China and the other way around. So we've got to find the right balance where and how we buy. And that brings me to your, back to your question. To find the right balance, it is so relevant that you digitize your processes like hell because that gives you the transparency and the flexibility to act. This is one, I would say, it's one X. The other X, and this is by far also as much important as the digitization part, it's the integration in your cross-functional partners. It's an old story. We always want to be early embedded. But now, with all these kind of experiences, with all these kind of transparency, we can add value to the R&D guys, product managers, and quality guys. That puts us into the position that we really can earn our place at the decision table which is needed. Does that make sense for you? Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> very interesting. I think that, that, that I'm tempted to go back to, um, you know, Isabel ask, uh, ask a very interesting question. Um, Isabel, how do you see the future of procurement evolving, and what can we see in the procurement function in the next 10 years' time? Hmm. Um, first of all, I would want to say that this um, crisis has elevated the role of procurement, and we have to be very humble about it, because I think we should not 
stand out and say, we have saved this and we manage these supplier relationships very well. It's really about, we talked this morning about the ecosystem. Yeah, we are only part of an ecosystem to serve the consumer, in your uh, words, the patient then, uh, in the end, and, and this is crucial. So, so we have gained a seat at a lot of tables, but we have to continue to earn it. Yeah? And for me, this is one thing that, that we need to continue to do is how, do we, how are we early involved and how do we prove the value that we bring? The second question for me is on the topic of transparency. On the one hand, you talk about data, digitalization and so on. But it's also about us in procurement sharing that data broadly within the company because when I joined Biostore five years ago and I did all of my interviews with people at the beginning and I asked them what do you like about procurement, what do you expect from procurement, one thing that they said is procurement for me is a black box. Okay, yeah, so, so this is one thing that we have and we address but we have to address is how do we integrate, how do we become more open, like an open platform um, for our business partners as well. And then there is another big one. It's about, I don't see the savings. Okay, perhaps these days savings are important, but not the most important thing we focus on. But how do you really make it, whatever you do, business relevant, so that they see the value that you bring? And this goes back to your point. It's not only about cutting cost. It's also about delivering the product at the right quality in the right time. It's being early at the table to influence which partner is being chosen, or that we choose two partners at the beginning and not only one so that you don't even run into the risk of dual sourcing. I think if we do a better job at the beginning, we will actually have less savings afterwards because we have built in the ideas if, and the AI and whatever we have into the beginning. So I, I do think we need to be much more integrated into this whole ecosystem together with our suppliers, bring the supply base in the ideas in, and not only when we need them, but also when they need us. Yeah, we often talk about partnership and speaking at eye level and so on, but you know, you need to ask yourself, are we really true to our word always? I recently had an evaluation session with, uh, this was in the marketing space, with an agency, and uh, we do annual evaluations both ways. And I said to my team at the beginning, the cross-functional team, we need to give the partner, the agency, as much time to give us feedback as we give feedback. Because, you know, we are the customer, so we start talking, and we often tend to talk a little bit more and give a little bit more feedback than we want to hear. And I think this is really important, that we walk the talk. That seems very fascinating. Um, I asked this question to, to Len, but... What keeps you up at night, Klaus? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said that earlier to you. Um, I sleep quite well. So uh, the point is, uh, it's really the question, what keeps me up in the morning? And, and the point is, um, this transformation process really keeps me up in the morning. You know why? Because as you, maybe, as, as you know, Siemens is now more than 175 years old. So what does that mean? we did some kind of transformation in the past quite well. Otherwise, we wouldn't survive, okay? So now is the point when it comes to the next level of procurement within the function, we have to transform our processes heavily. And by doing so, you need your people. And we have to convince our people that digitalization is not a threat it makes your life easier. It's easily said, but it's a hell of a work to really implement it. And, and I remember a quote from, a, from the Dell CEO. He said, if you digitize, and sorry for that, if you digitize a shitty process, you have a shitty digitized process. And this is really a challenge per se. If you are operating in a brownfield process environment, you've got to find ways to convince your organization it's now time to move on. 
I mean, get rid of something and do your homework. And digitalization cannot cover everything. First of all, you have to do your homework and make life easier for your people. This is the thing which keeps me up in the morning because at the very final end, the people are the most important thing. And the last thing I would like to add is already in 2016, or I guess it was in 2017, I'm not quite sure about that. I, I read in a study from the World Economic Forum, and in this study was um, mentioned that already in 2017, the technical equipment and the technical environment to digitize and automize your administrative processes, 80% were already there. So now I would say 100% of the technique is available mm -hmm. to optimize and digitize your process. The real challenge is you, you have to convince your people. Otherwise, you will not make it. You will not get the transparency. You will not get the flexibility. You will not get the value you want to have. And this is, for me, the most important thing, this transformation process of the people. Thank you. I, I would, yeah, I, I would uh, agree to that, that the bringing the people with us on the journey is important, also keeping the people and upskilling the people so that they embrace the technology or the tools that you put in front of It's like putting a sports car in front of a person who has, you know, driven, I don't want to say which car, beforehand. It, it, it's a little bit like that. How do we teach them and how do we make them excited uh, for this amazing car and what the car can, can do? If they, if they only uh, drive in first gear, that's not going to really uh, get, be the most exciting ride. So, for me, this is this is uh, a very important. And what I have done is, um, especially over the last year, focused a lot on these digital skills. And I have, I think it starts with me. It starts with me. It starts with my leadership team. If we don't embrace the tools, if we don't lead by example, why do we, why can I expect that my people do this? So. Every time we have a town hall or a conference, I talk about it. Like, what is it that I learned? What have I done? You know, or what have I mastered? Yeah, I was able to upload, I don't know, something. Or I was recently in an event where I had to create my own avatar. And at the beginning, I felt like, I don't want to say a child, because my son can do it better than me. I had to ask him how to do it. But, you know, how, how do you... And, and then the second time you go to this event, you can teach the others how to do it. So I'm, I'm giving these very simple examples of what I am doing as their leader to upskill myself and how much fun it is and how important it is also to do that. Thank you. Um, Len, coming back to you, you know, we started this discussion with you and there has been some emphasis that you placed on supplier relationship management. Um, then conversation flowed to talk about, you know, sharing data, digitization, transparency, integrated supply chain, all that aspect. How easy and difficult that is. Uh, the reason I'm asking this question is that, you know, I won't name, but let's say in Midlands, I work with a the company, they won't share any data, or even the suppliers won't share any data with their OEM. And because the reason they will not share, and this is the exact uh, verbatim I'm quoting that, well, that will be used, uh, that may be used against them to negotiate on price and things. It may be different scenarios, but how do you go about incorporating the, these when you talk about transparency, sharing data? One or two key thoughts from everyone, if we can get you know something, what lessons we can get from um, from, from, from your operation? Yeah, you know, uh, great question. I've been very fortunate. So I had support uh, about a half a dozen years ago from our board and our executive uh, committee to really elevate and invest in procurement. We had been uh, very decentralized for decades. And what we wanted to do was create centralization through digitization. So we actually rolled out a marketplace in the 60 plus countries where we operate. And I think from a change management perspective, because with anything else, um, you know, and I've lived through the era of ERP and whatever else, the technology is always ahead of us as human beings. 
And the first group that I really needed to deal with was the, my own procurement team because they wanted to hold on to all of those practices that they were most comfortable with and that they were very good at. It's like everything else, right? When you become a manager, you're always taught, always give away the things that you're good at and start to grow and develop and invest in other areas. And so once we were able to get through the procurement team, really allowing our business partners, our budget owners to have and be enabled through our e-marketplace to be able to help with the selection of the suppliers. We've automated RFP processes. We've even automated elements like writing a good scope of work. Um, what we found was that level of engagement really required the next phase, which was our business partners now saying to us, well, why are you giving us procurement work? Why are you making us do your job, right? Because they viewed us as having to do that work. And so we needed to create why that was of value and important to them. And we focused on really important elements like cycle time um, in terms of, you know, from the point of when I have a problem to where I have the right team or right uh, supplier to work on that problem to getting them to start to work. And what we were able to do through levels of automation was really accelerate the cycle time, make it easy to be able to work with preferred suppliers, make it easy to go through uh, the contracting process. And so we saw a, a reduction of 50, 60 percent on cycle time. And what we also did was create an environment where continuous improvement was where we invested our time, getting feedback from them around the user experience. And where we're at today, because of all of that investment over the past half a dozen years, is we've got uh, over 90% use of preferred suppliers, 90% use of preferred buying channels, right? And most importantly, in that era, even though it wasn't a goal, we went from 85,000 to 45,000 suppliers. So we took out 40,000 points of risk and we created an environment with, where many of our users now help us with defining the segmentation and are engaged with the supplier relationship management. So now from this rich data, we're able to make better and smarter decisions. I'll give you an example. In the early phases of this, one of the things that our CEO wanted to look at was our travel budget. And what we found in our travel budget was 60 plus percent of our travel were for internal meetings as opposed to external meetings, right? And so what that really did was those insights drove us around how to make best use of the resources that are available. I think Isabel said it's not about savings, it's about productivity. It's about how you use your resources in the most productive and effective way. And we've been able to translate those types of uh, insights into areas like learning and development, obviously use of third parties. So enabling through data and insights and really trying to transfer the why to the end user, because ultimately we're invested in the end user's success. That's our role. Thank you. If you have anything to add on that. Yeah, absolutely. I very much like your example of these travel expenses because it, it looks like big corporations have the same stuff. So we also launched the um, project um, travel minus 50% that it was before COVID and uh, it also paid off. So uh, maybe another example I would like to share with you is, um, and that goes back to transparency and also value. Um, we have the, the opportunity or the fortune uh, to use a software, um, a software from our colleagues from DI, digital industry, which allows us to create, we call it a digital cost twin. So what does that mean? Uh, with a simulation um, software kit from our colleagues, we can easily um, analyze what are the material costs of any kind of product. And, and this is fascinating because then you can analyze the cost breakdown of the supply and it creates enormous transparency. And it also gives you the opportunity what will happen if you replace material if you produce it in a different um, area. It, it allows you completely to simulate the cost situation. So, and on top of that, we add recently, we call it a digital green twin, that allows us to calculate the CO2 emission of the products which our suppliers uh, deliver to us. So what I'm trying to say is we bring then this the simulation digital software, we bring different dimensions of these value created together. That means sustainability, that means productivity, 
and also that means resilience. And that is a clear value for the business and allows us to get in touch with our R&D people earlier. So it, it, it's not good enough to say to an R&D guy, hey, please invite me earlier, because then the R&D guy would say, why? And with this additional information and transparency, they realize, oops, there is an additional value if I invite these procurement people, because they add value for me. Mm -hmm. And this is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, we analyze more than 10 billion euros, and we have more than 10 million data points, which allows us to do these analytics. Yeah, that means on one side, you need the data, and you need the analytics. And I, I realized that some companies only have the data, which is sometimes not good enough quality-wise. Yep. <coughs> and other have analytics, which sometimes came from these famous uh, typical suspects like BCG and, and the like. And if you want to create value, you have to bring these together. And this is the next level. Thank you for, for that. I think just if you have anything to add. <laughs> yeah, uh, apart from I'm well, envious, really. I yeah. will not <laughs> compete with yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but what, perhaps from a different angle, I think that sustainability and, and doing something for the greater good of the planet is the door opener for transparency um, with our suppliers and with the N minus whatever supply base that we have. Because when you look at Ecovadis, SEDEX, all of these providers, they are gathering data, not only for me, but when this data is gathered for somebody else and I'm a member already, then I have access to all of this data. And I think this is some, this is for me is a good example of how we can share more instead of redoing everything, but share more for the greater good of something. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. So again, I, we, we have got just about seven minutes left, and I would like to raise some you know, questions coming from the floor. Um, and what would be helpful is, given the number of questions, I'm not going to cover all of them. So please, if you could briefly uh, respond to those, that would be really helpful. So the first question is that, you know, this call for greater integration between procurement, operations, and manufacturing has been for decades. Uh, what is preventing it from happening? And this question I will direct to, to Len. Yeah, so you know, having grown up in manufacturing before I moved into uh, supply chain and procurement, I think sometimes you know your manufacturing organization views your your supplier base as the as the enemy uh, or the competitor, right? Um, I think what you need is I think you need uh, that type of uh, leadership at the at the plant level and at the manufacturing level, right? A commitment there and an understanding there that your patient or your customer. Uh, only knows and understands the name on the label of the product, and that's your name, right? So viewing your supplier base as an extension of your own organization is critically, critically important. That creates platforms for information sharing and, and mutual benefit. And I think, you know, as we continue to see technology change at such an incredible pace, you know, we're experiencing greater and greater use of our supplier base. You know, we're on the threshold of gene and cell therapies, which are now creating, I think, collaborative environments with many, many stakeholders. It's, we're no longer in a world of just pushing out products and solutions. We're in a world where we're contributing to a solution to multiple stakeholders. And I think that type of mindset uh, is really, I think, going to elevate supply chain. Do you need more procurement and sourcing competency to be a chief supply chain officer versus manufacturing competencies? I believe in the former as opposed to the latter. Again, having started my career in manufacturing and as an engineer. A question to Isabel. You know, the question coming is, the supply chain ecosystem that we are talking about with greater sustainability, greater resilience, ESG, regionalization, all these are going to come at a cost. So how are companies going to manage those costs? That's uh, one of the audience asking this question. Mm. At the beginning of the journey, you often find opportunities that are good for the planet and that are good from a cost perspective. So for example, you know, take a Nivea uh, body cream bottle. Yeah, If you uh, reduce the basis weight of that material, you use less virgin plastic 
and you save cost. Yeah, eventually, yeah, you, at the beginning you have some low-hanging fruit that you can do, eventually this becomes, uh, becomes more challenging. Um, and I do think there is a time where the company has to stand up, and they do, a lot of them do, and say, we swallow it, we swallow it, because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, because what is the alternative? The alternative could be that in 10 years from now you're not on shelf anymore. So, so you really have to look at the bigger picture and not just at the cost element. Thank you. I think I've got just to add on yeah. that. Um, for me, sustainability is is no longer a pure cost issue. I strongly believe that sustainability will influence our license to do business. Exactly. And this is by far more above productivity. Absolutely. At the final end, it will hit mm. the productivity. That's that's for sure. But uh, when, we, when we see um, new tenders are coming up, specifically in the project business, there's a clear focus on sustainability issues. And it's not only CO2 emission, by the way. This also includes small, medium enterprises, or maybe, Len, you are based in the US, uh, you know that um, there is a request for manufacturing in the US now. OK? Um, and this is, this is so relevant for the business. Thank you. I think I'm slightly diverting, you know, because procure transformation of procurement function uh, cannot be complete without transformation of human resources. Sure. So the question that is coming from the floor is, how are you going to, um, what sort of skills and qualities that you are required for procurement people to deal with all these unexpected circumstances, risk, and making your supply chain more resilient? What sort of skills and qualities you are looking for in new procurement, fun, uh, procurement um, resources. That the question goes to me? I think I will, <laughs> I, this is an interesting question. So if we can probably in less than 30 seconds get a view from all the speakers. So Len, I will start with you very briefly. Yeah, I think, you know, I always, I always ask uh, to have an organization where I have great procurement people that are excellent business people as well, right? And I think the competencies and skills we're looking for now are influence skills, the ability to be a great storyteller, the ability to really understand markets and marketplaces, the ability to really look at information and data and try to derive insights. Um, and, and so I think some of the traditional work like negotiations um, and, and some of the fundamentals uh, will always be there, but now we really need to add uh, better business interaction or collaboration skills. Thank you. Anything to add? Absolutely. We need more cross-functional skills, um, and also we need more analytics skills. Um, if you want to use more platforms going forward, maybe commodity management mm -hmm. is no longer at that relevance as it is today. You really need more analytics Thank you. For me, it's on the one hand analytics, on the other hand, the whole stakeholder management, storytelling, I love the, the phrase, um, and the whole business savviness is critical. Thank you. I have got a lot of questions, but I think I have got literally one minute. So one question to, to you, Klaus. How do you go about um, managing or reducing the scope three emission of, your, of, of the supply base? This is a question coming from audience that how you could actively manage the scope three emission of your supply base, which is difficult to manage. Yeah. There are two things which are so relevant. First, and I mentioned that before, get transparency as much as you can. And for that, we use this digital green twin, as I said before. And the second is um, get in touch with your suppliers. And we do that by, uh, we, do, we call it a carbon web assessment. You want to know from our suppliers what are their activities, what is their effort, to be more sustainable, sustainable. And, and I think at the very end is really get transparency as much as you can and based on that, do the right activities. Great, thank you very much, Klaus. I think we are literally running out of time. I have a great set of fantastic questions and I apologize if I wasn't able to pick that up here, but please feel free to reach out to, to, to the speakers here and you know have that question one-to-one. -one. Um, thank you so much, Len, for joining us. It's a fantastic session. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, um, Klaus and Isabel. It's a great pleasure to be with you here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I think we have a